had to do something. I'm running to stop the takeover of City Hall by the special interest groups who have ruined our city's progress, who do not care about your safety, and who will continue to waste your money. The influence of unelected individuals over the previous council has led to the mess we're in now, and we can't afford to have more of the same. While others in this race are being guided by their friends and those who they'll have to answer to, I'm guided by our residents and the taxpayers of this city. Hamilton needs a mayor who will do what is necessary to stop the waste of taxpayer money, a mayor who will support our police and ensure that they have the resources to keep you safe, and a mayor who will take bold action to ensure that members of our community who need support are not forced to live in tents. I have a plan to ensure that when we spend your money, you're getting value, a plan to resource the police so they can keep us safe, a plan to end encampments across the city and ensure that people facing homelessness have access to a roof over their heads, and a plan to install lighting on high-use trails and parks so women can feel safe after dark. Our community needs a mayor who can tackle these challenging issues head on and take direct action because our residents deserve to feel safer. Nobody knows the city like I do. I've been dedicated to our city my entire life and I hope that I can be your mayor again to get the city back on track and stop the takeover of City Hall by special interests. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, candidate Bertina. And of course, we wish Bob a speedy recovery. Next, up next, we'll be hearing from candidate Andrea Horvath. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, glad to be here with everyone tonight. I know that this is going to air over and over again, so maybe I shouldn't identify that it's a night, but it's my pleasure to be here at the West Dale Theatre. I uh, also want to wish the uh, Jewish community of Shona Tova uh, Happy New Year, and want to say to my friend, Bob Bertina, who I've known for many, many, many years, I uh, hope you're feeling okay, Bob. I hope your dose of COVID-19 isn't uh, one of the worst and that you recover quickly. Uh, it's great to be here to talk about the important things uh, that uh, our city needs to have addressed. I, I can say that as a home Hamiltonian, born and bred, uh, I have a lot of passion for our city and I look forward to being able to take all of the things I've learned as a person that's worked on behalf of Hamiltonians literally her entire life uh, and make a difference for the people of Hamilton. There's just no doubt that uh, having been born in Stony Creek, uh, living in other parts of the city, uh, Westdale, for example, or at least going to McMaster at Westdale, living in the West Hamilton area, the West Mountain area, living in Flamborough, uh, I really do have a handle on what this city's all about. And I believe we have our best uh, days ahead of us as a city, uh, and I know that all of the work that I've done fighting for Hamiltonians and supporting Hamiltonians and working on their behalf uh, since before I was even elected, uh, whether it was at the legal clinic, doing adult education work, uh, whether it was as a, a city councillor or as an MPP, Hamiltonians have always been at the heart of everything that I have done, and that won't change if you give me the honour uh, of becoming your mayor. Hamiltonians are fantastic people. We're full of determination, we're full of grit, and we take care of one another because we believe uh, that to have a strong city, all of us need to be strong and we need to, we need to be, be working with each other uh, to create an environment where everyone can thrive. That's what my action plan talks about. Uh, I have an action plan that's very clear about what I think are the opportunities that the city uh, has ahead of them, as well as how we can deal with some of the challenges that we're facing as a city. I want people to know Hamilton has always been my hometown. I've always lived here and my passion has never waned for the city and the people of Hamilton. Candidate Horvath, thank you very much for thank that. You. We will now continue on with candidate Keenan Loomis. Thank you very much, Mike. And I want to thank Cable 14, especially all of the unsung heroes behind the scenes uh, for hosting these debates. Like everything else you do, it is a true community service. Hello, Hamilton. Thank you so much for tuning in to make a more well-informed decision on October 24th. I know we have a lot of supporters today tuning in. Hello, I've uh, received a lot of messages of uh, support today, so it's great to see you again. And for those of you who have yet to make up your mind, I look forward to sharing my vision for a future Hamilton. I'm Keenan Loomis, I am the former president and CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And for the last 13 years, I've been working hard for the business community and for helping make our local economy that much better. 
But my mo most important job title is that of father of three. Uh, and my three are uh, tuning in tonight. Hi, babies, how are you? And uh, husband to Trish, who joins me here tonight. She is the Hamiltonian, uh, and she uh, was born uh, in uh, Henderson and raised on the East Mountain uh, by a steel worker and a uh, Catholic school teacher. Hi, Ma. Hi, Dad. And uh, she is why I am here today. As I always say, I fell in love with a girl, and then I fell in love with her city. I've been all in running for mayor since January uh, when I stepped down from my job. And the reason I did that is after 10 years of being Hamilton's voice of business and raising a family in this community, I got sick and tired of banging my head against the wall at City Hall. Now, we have come a long way over the last decade, and I've been proud to be a part of that. And we've been working with organizations and companies and individuals and not-for-profits to help progress the city. But the fact of the matter is that most of our progress has been in spite of our leadership at City Hall. And I've asked, like all of you, imagine how much better we could be as a community if we had great leadership, tackling our challenges and taking advantage of our great opportunities. So I decided to step up and be the change that we need to see. We are not going to live up to that potential if we see all around us by electing career politicians who have been a part of our past problems. More of the same will only lead to more of the same, and we cannot afford that. Their partisan baggage will only hold us back, if not uh, even worse, infect City Hall. We have a very clear choice on October 24th. We can either go backward or we can go forward. And I look forward to tonight to sharing our detailed plans and exciting vision for a future Hamilton. To both of our candidates here on stage, thank you both very much. And as I mentioned, we invited all of the other mayoral candidates to participate in this program with a recorded two-minute introductory statement. Right now, let's hear from Ejaz Butt, Paul Fromm, and Solomon Ikiu. Hello, everyone. Thanks to Cable 14 for giving me the opportunity to introduce myself to all Hamiltonians. I was born in Pakistan, where I could not complete my degree in Bachelor of Science due to joining the Military Academy of Pakistan. During the military service and training, and also in college life, I learned the leadership, public speaking, discipline, loyalty, morality, and perseverance to fight with difficult ch challenges successfully. I immigrated from Pakistan in late 80s, and since then, this great city has become my permanent home. I am very proud to be a Canadian Hamiltonian. I have held various community leadership positions, such as being the president and the founding member of the Ontario Taxi Worker Union. All my leadership positions were either roller coaster ride or Rocky Mountain hikes, but the end result was nothing but success. Now I believe this is the time to owe it back to the great city after achieving all my objectives in my life and having using my experience and leadership ability to become your mayor. In the end, I will let you know all my great Hamiltonians that my whole family, including my own children, do not want me to run for any political office because they want me to get retired and enjoy my life. But I told them that this city and people of this city, specifically the youth, are my passion, and I want to correct the status quo, uh, status quo system in the city hall. However, if I am elected, people will see a definitely noticeable change with full transparency, and if not elected, then no regrets. Thank you. Fellow Hamiltonians, my name is Paul Fromm, and I'm running for mayor. I am the motorist friend and the freedom candidate. Everybody knows the roads in Hamilton are a mess. Potholes, which would swallow a tank in some cases, uh, road, lanes arbitrarily blocked off with cones, no work being done, no hole in the, in the ground, and of course, there's the general blight of the GTA, and that's traffic gridlock. Does, doesn't just affect Hamilton, but it's a big problem. And it's going to be, have to be solved by three levels of government. We need somebody who's going to tell truth to power at other levels of government. Basically, we're full. We don't have the infrastructure. The second issue that is on my mind is uh, freedom. We've been through a bad two and a half years with COVID. Governments at all levels have 
have trampled on our individual liberties in a way that has not been seen since the Second World War. Uh, vaccine mandates, masking mandates, uh, gathering ma uh, uh, mandates, uh, freedoms have been lost, and some of them I don't think are going to come back. One of the saddest things is that uh, uh, over 400 Hamilton uh, city workers uh, were laid off because they wouldn't reveal the vaccination status or they were unvaxxed. They've been hired back, but they've been without pay for months. I would want that restored. I'm the freedom candidate. I was a proud supporter of the Truckers Freedom Convoy, and I stand for individual liberty, and I will open up city council. It's become secretive uh, and dysfunctional and out of touch. I will be available anytime to hear what constituents have to say. On October 24th, vote for me, Paul Fromm, the, the motorist friend and the freedom candidate. Hello, Hamilton. My name is Solomon Iquiu, and I'm running to be your next mayor. I have a vested interest in the people of the city and see myself as a voice that can speak to issues from a unique perspective. I have devoted my time to serving people in all walks of life and have a heart to truly see change in areas that have been stagnant over the years. We have a generation of youth rising up that are dependent on this city for security, stability, and safety. We have a population of people that are looking for uh, equity, people looking for opportunities, people looking for hope, and people seeking acceptance and unity. I have a tremendous faith in this beautiful city to rise out of the ashes into new life, bringing revival to parts of the city that have been neglected and shedding light on the needs of people that have been ignored. I believe in stepping outside of the box and seeing the big picture of Hamilton. I envision a city where the voices of the people are heard and validated, and change is not only promised but also implemented. Year after year, generation after generation, the promises of many have led to dead ends, like a tree that bears no fruit. As a candidate in this campaign, I humble myself to acknowledge that I may not have all the answers yet, but I can assure you that I will commit to gathering wisdom and insight greater than my own uh, to initiate and execute changes in the right direction. We truly live in a marvelous nation that Hamilton is blessed to be a part of. I'm always moved when I hear God keep our land glorious and free in our national anthem. May the city of Hamilton also be kept glorious, safe, secure, prosperous, and thriving. I look forward to the opportunity to serving the people of this great city. Thank you. Thank you very much to the mayoral candidates, Ijaz Butt, Paul Fromm, and Solomon EQ for your statements. And of course, Jim Davis, uh, he declined to participate in recording, but later we will hear from statements from Hermes Ishaya and Michael Pattison. Continuing with our candidates here on stage tonight, let's bring in our local media panel now. With us for this debate are Tevia Morrow for the Hamilton Spectator, Matt Ingram from CHCH News, and Dave Woodard from 900 CHML Radio, and Sarah Piesker from CBC Hamilton. Each of our reporters will be choosing a candidate to answer a question, and then the other candidate can choose to respond. All of your responses should be kept to about a minute. I will give a warning when time has run out. Our first question comes from the spectators, Tevia Morrow. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, candidates, uh, nice to see you tonight. Uh, Keenan, I'll direct this question to you. Um, uh, the city staff have been studying the potential widening of the Red Hill Valley Parkway and the link as a possible uh, way to ease congestion on those two uh, city highways. Um, some councillors have expressed support for this idea. Others uh, are, are not big fans of, of the concept of widening these highways. What do you think of that possibility? I know that traffic congestion, and first of all, thank you uh, for the uh, question, Tevia. I know that traffic congestion is a, uh, a big problem here in Hamilton, and there's a lot of concerns, especially as we uh, change the uh, configuration of our downtown streets. And I think for far too long, we've been using Main Street as a drive-through. Um, I always say uh, Hamilton, uh, downtown should be a destination, not a drive-through. 
and Main Street and King Street have been thoroughfares, and we've been paying a price uh, for that. So if we're going to be building LRT along one of those major corridors and we're going to be altering uh, the traffic on Main Street to two-way, I do think that we have to look at other solutions as to how we get around the city. And I know that the, the link and the Red Hill Valley were contemplated as being six lanes, um, and that's how they were built. And so, uh, in fact, for uh, not too much money, we can actually uh, create six lanes along those, uh, those corridors. So I think we should uh, definitely be studying that. Candidate Loomis, thank you for that. Uh, Candidate Horvath, if you wish to respond. Sure, just uh, really, really briefly, uh, I think anybody that's u that uses those corridors know very well uh, that it's getting quite congested, uh, con congested, and I certainly do believe that when it comes to issues of congestion and issues of safety, that we do need to look at uh, the capacity of our roadways. So I'm, I'm happy that the city's looking at that, looking forward to seeing the recommendation uh, when it comes forward, uh, and uh, taking some leadership on making sure that uh, no matter where you live in Hamilton, you're able uh, to get around and to get back and forth to the places you need to be. Thank you for that. Final word to you, if you wish, Candidate Loomis. Yeah, sure. I know the law of induced demand, which means if you build wider roads, then that accommodates more cars. Um, so that's certainly a concern. But in, in this case, I don't think that that's necessarily true. This is a highway that uh, goes through our city. And I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that we're building a city that will be 800,000 people by 2050. And so it doesn't make sense for the link in the Red Hill to be expanded. And I've always been uh, most concerned about goods movement. Um, and it's a matter of keeping our economy going. Thank you both very much for that. We'll now continue on with CHCH's Mr. Matt Ingram. Thanks very much, Mike, and thank you, Andrea and Keenan, for participating tonight. Uh, my question is for you, Andrea. I'm curious if you are elected, what are you going to do to bring higher paying jobs to the city given the inflation and affordability being such a challenge for many families? Thanks very much, Matt, uh, for the question, and it's extremely uh, it's ex an extremely important one uh, because we know that uh, if people are going to be able to make Hamilton their home uh, and uh, and stay here, we need to have good jobs for them to be able to go to. My action plan lays out a number of opportunities uh, that we have in this city uh, to create good jobs for folks, and it's everything from uh, making sure that we are helping uh, job creators to succeed in our city uh, when when it comes to things like siting of new businesses or expansions, people are having a really hard time uh, getting approvals through the city. So, so we need to fix that. Uh, we know that there's opportunities down at the uh, the former Stelco lands for particularly green industries, which is extremely exciting. Uh, but I think we also have a lot of opportunity when it comes to uh, jobs in the digital sector, uh, when it comes to taking advantage of just the amazing history and capacity we have in arts and culture, particularly music, Absolutely, film. Uh, these are all things that I'll be working very hard uh, to, uh, you know, to, to ensure that get the support, the attention they need from the economic Devel development department and from other staff. Candidate Horvath, thank you. Candidate Loomis. I've been working on bringing higher paying jobs to Hamilton for the last 13 years, first at McMaster Innovation Park and then as the president and CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. I understand our great strengths and our talents that we have in this community. I understand the sectors uh, that we have as growth areas, and we have particular strengths in here, like uh, technology, agriculture, healthcare, uh, hydrogen. If we're going to decarbonize our industry, we have the ability to be an expert in uh, clean tech um, and arts and culture, as Andrea mentioned. And uh, yes, there are a lot of impediments to business growth uh, in this community. The city is in the way, um, and so we intend to invest a million dollars in the Hamilton Economic Development Department. Their budget has not been increased in well over 10 years, and as a result, companies are looking to Hamilton, uh, but they're not being accommodated here. We're not rolling out the red carpet, and so they are going elsewhere. Thank you for that. Candidate Horvath, if you wish, final word. Sure, just real, really briefly, one of the things that we need to do is maximize the collaboration between some of the players in our economy right now. And Keenan uh, certainly talks a lot about business because that's his his forte, uh, but we also have an important education sector. Uh, we have amazing things that are possible and already happening in our uh, healthcare sector, uh, whether it's biotech, uh, whether it's the uh, the focus on pandemics uh, that we see at McMaster and vaccines. Uh, there's just so much that we have. The college, the university, the synergies that, uh, that they bring, uh, they need to be at the table with us as we 
map out what our future looks like in terms of good jobs. Thank you both very much for that. We'll continue on now with our media. CHML's Dave Woodard, your question please, sir. Thanks, Mike, and thank you, Andrea and Keenan, for being here tonight. I'll address my question to candidate Loomis. Uh, your competitor, uh, Bob Bertino, talked about hiring new police officers if he was elected. What is your stance on the level of policing in the city right now? And conversely, uh, would you look at cutting the police services budget if you were elected? Thank you for that question. Um, no, I would not cut the police budget. Um, and no, I would not uh, lessen or, or fewer, uh, bring fewer uh, police uh, into Hamilton. Um, what I would do is, is shift their focus right now. They are uh, dealing with a lot of stuff uh, on our streets that they shouldn't be dealing with. Um, and as a result, uh, they're being taken away from their core duties. When I talk to people in Ancaster, when I talk to people in Binbrook and in Winona, they don't see any presence at all of the Hamilton Police Services, and they're asking for more policing. When I talk to parents about the safety of our streets, they want more enforcement. I was talking to somebody yesterday about the racing that happens at night. We can hear it happening all the time and because there's no enforcement. So I think we need to detask the police from dealing with mental health and addictions issues um, and to allow them to solve uh, the, the crimes that are happening in our street and to be proactive in their enforcement of uh, so many of the issues that are, are transpiring on a daily basis. Keenan, thank you for that. Andrea, over to you. Well, I would just like to say that the challenges around mental health and addictions on our streets and people in crisis has been ignored by other orders of government for a very long time. Uh, and police have been asked to step in and, and do that work. Uh, they're being asked to do more and more because the other orders of government have not done their part. And I have to say, uh, there are some pretty amazing programs that they've put in place. I can remember, and it was actually recently in the, the newspaper again, uh, when the young boy uh, was uh, was killed by somebody in mental health crisis. Now that took place 25 years ago. It was actually just a couple blocks from where I lived at the time. Uh, and it was a horrible situation, but out of that, the police st uh, stood up and they said, we are gonna try to do more crisis intervention ourselves because everybody calls 911 uh, and, and we're gonna try to fill that gap. Well, the gap, it needs to be filled because there's not enough attention being given to these issues. Uh, I'm looking forward to sitting with the police services board, uh, with the chief, uh, with others to talk about things like their social navigator program, uh, like COAST, like the rapid intervention, intervention support team. Why? Uh, because we need those things until we can actually start providing the crisis support that people deserve Candidate so they Horvath. don't end up in a bad way. Thank you for that. Final word to you, Candidate Loomis. Yeah, the fact of the matter is that it's very difficult for us to lower the budget of uh, Hamilton Police Services. But all additional funding should be going to providing uh, supports to the folks in our city that are supporting mental health care and addiction services as well. So again, we can free up the police to be doing the work that they're doing. I uh, as well support uh, the RISC program, which is uh, exactly about that, providing uh, funding for those uh, social services organizations, and we need to be doing much more of that. Thank you both for that. Up next from CBC, Sarah Piesker, your question, please. Thanks, Mike. My question's for Andrea. Both of you support maintaining the current urban boundary. The provincial government says it will find a way to stop that, uh, to stop maintaining it, to expand it, but hasn't been very specific on how. Can you be specific on mechanisms or ways that you would use to prevent the province from following its own agenda? Uh, thanks, Sarah, very much for the question. Folks will know I have a, a lot of experience when it comes to all of the orders of government, in fact, not just at City, at city Council, but also at uh, the province of Ontario and, of course, interfacing with the federal government as well. I have always uh, been firmly against the expansion of the urban boundary, unlike Mr. Loomis, who has flip-flopped on that issue uh, recently. Uh, I, th I just think it's the smart thing to do, and it's an environmental imperative that we build within our existing boundary because there's available space. But part of the problem that we have is that is that builders are not able to get their, their units 
it's built, uh, whether you are a not-for-profit provider, whether you're a, a for-profit provider, whether you're building uh, you know, rental units or condos uh, or homes, they cannot get their projects uh, approved. And so what happens then is it increases the pressure uh, to expand beyond the urban boundary. I've already talked to all of these folks and made a commitment that we're going to work together uh, to make sure that all forms of housing are addressed in our city. We need them, but we don't need to expand the urban boundary. And I'm hoping that when Mr. Ford makes a decision, when the premier of the province makes a decision, uh, that uh, he'll be thoughtful about what's best for Hamilton. Hamiltonians know I will always fight for what's best for Hamilton. Uh, and I'm Horgoth, looking forward to that. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Uh, Candidate Loomis. Thank you for that. We announced a plan uh, months ago to create 50,000 new homes in Hamilton within the current urban boundary because I have heard that maintaining our farmland uh, in this breadbasket uh, that is Southern Ontario is really important to the residents of Hamilton. So what I would ask Premier Ford is to allow the city to put forward the plan that will achieve all of our future growth within the current urban boundary. We have so many opportunities to intensify within uh, the current urban boundary. Uh, certainly along our transit lines, uh, there are a lot of projects within the urban boundary that have been languishing for years and years. And so we can accommodate all of that future growth within the current urban boundary. And uh, I would only say that, you know, we can sit down, we can uh, come to this conclusion. I would ask the premier to give us the powers, not to expand the urban boundary, but the powers to intensify. And I can guarantee you that I will get my phone call answered. And that is not the case uh, with my competitor here. Final word to you, Candidate Horvath. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, one of the realities is uh, that I've been working on housing pretty much my entire life. Uh, I know that file inside and out, uh, unlike my competitor who's playing catch up in terms of the policy details. But it's really clear that the Premier is going to make a decision. Uh, and what I will be doing and what I've already committed to uh, is working with providers of housing to figure out how we can best uh, do what's right for our city. Uh, we don't want to become a sprawling bedroom community. Uh, we want to keep the, the soul of Hamilton. We want to keep our city a place which, which is not just a place for units. You can throw out numbers about units, but it's really about building communities. It's about making sure that as we build housing, we're, we're keeping communities whole, we're providing the infrastructure that they need, we're providing the community space that they need, and we're making sure that we have a range of options in terms of affordability, in terms of housing type. Uh, I could go on for a while on this topic. It's uh, something I've been passionate about for very many years. Thank you both very much for that. Uh, the viewers, they have been sending in their questions and they've been submitting them by sending us tweets at Cable 14 or emailing election at Cable14.com. This particular question comes in asking, the Premier has publicly stated that he intends to expand the new strong mayor powers to more cities, including Hamilton, in the coming term. If elected, would you support and implement these powers? Candidate Loomis, you are up first. Well, when I announced that I was running in early January, there was no such thing as strong mayor powers in Ontario. And my intention all along has to, been to run uh, and to be a mayor that will achieve consensus around that council table because we know for far too long that has been missing in Hamilton. And all of this talk about strong mayor powers, first of all, uh, the details are still a little murky. Um, he has not talked about uh, Hamilton at all. And uh, third, I don't even know if our city uh, has the, the governance uh, uh, structure to be able to accommodate this. So it doesn't change the original purpose for why I decided to run uh, for mayor. And regardless of what comes down the pipe, I will be working uh, to build consensus along that council table uh, to the point that uh, I don't foresee the need uh, to have those strong mayor powers. Candidate Loomis, thank you very much. Candidate Horvath. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. I, I, I want to say that um, I have always been a collaborator. I have always operated in a collaborative fashion. I really believe that that's how the best decisions are made and that's how the best plans are developed. Uh, so with a strong mayor system or not, I am never going to stop 
uh, behaving the way that I always have, which is reaching out, bringing people in, having important conversations where there are times when people don't agree, those things can be put in a parking lot uh, and the consensus can be built or the uh, collaboration can be built around common ground. Uh, and that has certainly been my vast experience and uh, something that I would bring to this role as well. We have a lot of opportunities in the city of Hamilton, some challenges, absolutely, uh, but to a, an experienced mayor that understands the leadership role within the context of the provincial uh, and municipal uh, orders of government is exactly what we need right now, especially as things keep changing. Thank you for that. Candidate Loomis, final response, if you wish. Yeah, so as uh, I have been a part of the renewal of the city over the last 10 years, it has all been uh, through collaboration with all the stakeholders in this community, uh, including the businesses, uh, the institutions, the educational institutions, and uh, the city hall as well. So I will continue to as well uh, uh, lead by consensus building. And um, you know, again, I just don't uh, see the need um, to be able to uh, have these types of super veto powers. I think that that uh, starts to poison the well at City Hall when that's the last thing that we need. Thank you both very much for that uh, question and those answers. We will be going now back to our media panel. He's back from the Hamilton Spectator. Tebby Morrow, your question, please. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, I'll address this uh, question to, to Andrea. I think uh, Keenan uh, opened the door for this question. He suggested that maybe your phone call to Queen's Park to the Premier's office wouldn't be answered. And I think it's possibly alluding to your role as, uh, as leader of the opposition for many years. And, you know, you, maybe you had a bit of uh, some friction, quite a bit of friction at times with Mr. Ford. Do you think voters would have to worry that this would shut out Hamilton from any future uh, funding opportunities from, from the provincial government? Uh, absolutely not, and I want to assure Hamiltonians that uh, it, not for a minute do I think that that's going to happen. Why? Because I understand how government works, and so do all of the players uh, that uh, are experienced in governance. Uh, I certainly did have a role to play in, as official opposition, uh, and Mr. Ford knew that. The premier of this province knew that. I have to say I was very pleased when I announced that I was going to run for mayor. Uh, the Premier sent a very positive, uh, affirming, affirming note uh, about the fact that he knows that I'll wake up every day and, and fight for Hamiltonians. Uh, it's an oppositional system at Queen's Park. Uh, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of oppositional kind of activity at, uh, this, at the city table as well, uh, and we need to get rid of that. Hamiltonians need to know that I will fight and work on their behalf, regardless of where they live in our city, when they chose to live in our city, what their political stripe is, because it's all about Hamilton. That's what I'm in it for and always have been, uh, and I think the Premier is very well aware of that. Candidate Horvath, thank you. Candidate Loomis, if you wish. Yeah, I, I think this is my biggest concern, um, and it's the biggest concern of so many people uh, that I meet as I'm knocking on the door, and that's that there's no secret that there's no love lost between uh, Andrea Horvath and the Premier of Ontario. There's been uh, a lot of criticisms of the Premier uh, and very few sol solutions offered, and there's no expectation that they will be able to work together in the future. And I think that's going to be a huge detriment uh, to the city of Hamilton. Say what you will about uh, candidate Horvath um, and about the platform and all of that, but if we can't work with higher levels of government, all of that goes away and we will not be able to live up to the full potential that Hamilton has. Final response to you, Andrea. Well, it's interesting. I uh, meet a lot of people on the doors as well, and I, I don't know how many folks have said, I get it, I get it. We go out and play hockey every night, me and my buddies, and we're on separate teams, and then after the game's over, we all just go for a beer together and, and have a good time. Uh, it's really naive to think that, um, that uh, the kinds of uh, partisan roles that get played uh, out at, uh, in our parliamentary democracy in, uh, at Queen's Park or in Ottawa uh, somehow then get translated into, uh, into the city uh, of Hamilton or into any city's politics. That's, that's just not, that's not, not how it works at all. Uh, and I think Mr. K Mr. Loomis needs to be a little bit more um, in tune uh, with, uh, with what the, the opposition role is as well as, as well as 
how many things the opposition was able to accomplish, uh, how much I was able to accomplish as opposition leader, uh, both you know with the Wynn government and uh, with the Ford government uh, as I was in opposition. And we achieved a lot of things for Hamilton because that's what it's about. Uh, it's about bringing the solutions uh, as well as the opposition. I'll, I'll send you some of the things I was able to achieve. Thanks to both of you for that response and thank you very much to Tevia for the question. We're going back to CHCH's Matt Ingram, your question, please, Matty. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, my question is for you, Keenan. Uh, the operating cost for the LRT, the projections, there's a $10 million difference between the lower projections and the higher projections. It's a pretty big variable, especially at a time when our, our city, like the rest of the country, is suffering some pretty hard economic times. If you're elected, what is your plan going to be to handle that, pay for it, deal with the fact that it's, it's kind of a blank check? Yeah, thanks for the question, Matt. Um, the operating cost is basically the only thing that the city of Hamilton uh, has to pay uh, when it comes to the LRT. So $3.4 billion uh, in infrastructure delivered to our community. And it's not just a transit solution, um, but it's also an infrastructure, uh, infrastructure solution. So modernizing the entire uh, corridor of the LRT. So that's 14 kilometers. Uh, in uh, our old lower city. So that's an incredible deal. Now that $30 million um, is offset by the ridership. So by the fare box, the, the stuff that comes in, the money that comes in when people pay to ride the uh, LRT. And so the variable is that it's difficult to, to project right now, especially uh, after COVID, uh, what the ridership is going to be. But that's the whole reason for uh, unlocking all the development along the line, because the more you build along the LRT line, the more riders that you are bringing into the project and the more revenue that you're bringing in as well. And do not forget all of the development that the LRT unlocks as well. And we're seeing it right before our eyes, billions of dollars. So for me, 20, $30 million, um, that is uh, nothing compared to what we're getting. Thank you for that, Keenan. Andrea? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, one of the things that I've stated clearly uh, is that I believe that uh, public transit needs to be operated uh, by by public workers. I, I really believe that the, uh, the transit uh, operators here in Hamilton, uh, the HSR, have been doing a fantastic job. Uh, and there's no doubt that the LRT is about economic development, absolutely, and investment for sure. But we also have to remember uh, that our transit system writ large needs to move people back and forth to jobs and to work. Uh, as we finish that LRT, we'll be able to expand our transit system uh, to more employers, more communities, uh, which they've been clamoring for, uh, for a very long time. When you add uh, the private profit motive into the equation, we are using public dollars and transit fares on, you know, basically the padding of the pockets of private interests. Uh, and we lose, as a result, accountability, but we still have to pay for administrative oversight. So it's, it's something that's a, a big decision that's coming, and I, I want it people to know my position, I'm very much in favor of, uh, of public transit being delivered uh, by public sector workers. Thank you for that response. Keenan, final word to you. Uh, nobody's even talking about the privatization of the LRT, and that wasn't even part of the question. Uh, there's no works. doubt it's going to be run publicly. Uh, it will either be by HSR or by Metrolinx, and this is part of the point. What is the right operator for this system? Is it HSR? Um, I believe that we have the right and we should uh, definitely be bidding on that project and be able to demonstrate that we will deliver the best services uh, for the taxpayer dollars. But if that's not the case, it's going to be Metrolink. So in either case, it's going to be a public re publicly run project. Thank you both for that. LRT, yes, a very hot topic still here in our city. Moving on, CHML's Dave Woodard. Your question, please, Dave. Thanks, Mike. I'll address this to candidate Horvath. Uh, 2022 has been one of the deadliest years for pedestrians uh, in Hamilton. There have been 18 traffic fatalities this year alone, I'm sure you know, um, the majority of which involve pedestrians. Um, in addition to the moves that have already been made, in addition to things that have already been promised, what specifically would you do to try to make Hamilton Street safer? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge the loss of life. Uh, and uh, my heart goes out to every person and, and, and their families and their neighborhoods, uh, their loved ones. It has been 
definitely a tragic year, uh, but there have also been people who have been injured uh, as well. That's just not acceptable. Hamilton has taken on a, a vision zero approach, uh, which is which is laudable, uh, which is necessary. Uh, we know that there are lots of changes, as you've mentioned, Dave, that are in the works, uh, but there's a couple of things I think we have to remember that each neighborhood uh, is different uh, and the solutions are going to be different in different types of neighborhoods and different on different kinds of streets. Uh, but there is a process that's being built in right now uh, to make sure that the traffic calming and traffic solutions and safety issues, most importantly, uh, are being implemented as we deal with our infrastructure. But there needs to be some proactive work as well. Uh, there's, for example, I was just up on, uh, up on um, Powerline Road and 52 Highway, uh, where there needs to be a roundup put in place uh, for, for for folks traveling that stretch of road. That's different than, for example, uh, putting bump outs in a in a neighborhood or uh, or putting uh, traffic calming uh, bumps uh, in the road to slow down traffic. There are lots of solutions. We, we have to have, have the to commitment. We have Thank to have the that. commitment. Candidate Loomis, my heart breaks for the people who are dying on our streets and their families. It is absolutely tragic and completely unavoidable. And as a parent of three, this is my biggest concern when my kids leave the house every single day to go to school. And I'm always telling them, make sure you make eye contact. And they roll their eyes as children do. But it's important for me to make sure that I've left that message with them as they leave the house. So as a result, Vision Zero is a big part of our, uh, of our platform. Uh, which is we are need to uh, aim to be a city where there is zero traffic deaths and zero fatalities on our streets. So uh, first thing we need to do is we need to lower the speed limits. People are driving way too fast on our streets. Um, and we need greater enforcement as well of those speed limits and other driving laws. This is where uh, more policing is a part of the solution. And we need to re-engineer our streets. As I go around from neighborhood to neighborhood, I talk to people about where they need a stop sign, where they need a speed bump, and we need to be listening to them in City Hall so that they can make their neighborhood safer for their children. Keenan, thank you for that. Back to you, Andrea. Uh, I just want to make note that um, this is something that I took on years and years ago in Ward 2 when I was a city councillor and achieved a number of the solutions that are now being put into other neighborhoods. Uh, we achieved those over 20 years ago now, and they work. Uh, you'll never be able to have enforcement at every street at every minute, uh, but I don't disagree that the uh, the danger is there uh, and that parents are terrified, cyclists are terrified, pedestrians are terrified, uh, cars are, are needing to use roads too, which are under uh, in very bad shape. Uh, sh bad shape in terms of repair. Uh, but what we have to do is make sure that we're implementing the solutions and that we're paying attention uh, to what the neighbors uh, are saying about their streets. They know how those streets operate better than anybody else. Uh, their input is extremely important. Thank you both uh, for those responses. CBC Hamilton's Sarah Piesker. She's back. Your question, please, Sarah. Thank you. This question is for Keenan. Your platform promises to immediately change zoning bylaws to improve turnaround times for development approvals. How would you go about that while ensuring the process remains rigorous from safety and community development perspectives and also environmental assessments and indigenous consultation? Can you be specific on what red tape needs to go? Absolutely, thank you, Sarah. Um, so as these proposals are being put into the city, they're being signed off by engineers, by architects. There is a, a, a large amount of community consultation that goes into uh, these proposals. Um, they have to. But what we need to do is we need to speed up the process. We need to make it as of right um, allowable for people, for example, to be able to create in-law suites um, on their properties, either a basement or above a garage or a laneway home as well. And right now, um, they are not uh, allowed as of right. They are in some uh, parts of the city, but in some parts uh, you can do it, but you also then have to apply for a variance uh, to create an extra parking spot. So we need to uh, eliminate all of uh, the red tape um, when it comes to this, because in-law suites are really, really important to allowing uh, seniors to age in place to accommodate our children as they grow up and go to university and yet can't afford uh, a rental uh, property. It allows that, uh, that uh, Tim Hortons employee in Binbrook who finds it difficult to get to her work because it does, it's not served by transportation, but also because there's nothing available 
um, within her price range within Binbrook. So um, I'm very, uh, very passionate about that. I think that's a way to spread uh, low-income uh, residential uh, rental throughout the entire city. Thank you for that. Candidate Horvath. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mike. Uh, I, I think what the answer was is you can't. You can't do that immediately, and it, it just shows the lack of experience uh, of, of Mr. Loomis. Uh, but these are important goals to reach, for sure. Uh, what we do have is a city that's already uh, achieved some of those uh, things that he's talked about. Some of those things are already in place, and we just need to make sure uh, that we're providing a, an ease of, uh, of opportunity for people to make those changes. But let's not forget, uh, we need to have gentle de density in places where, the, where that's what works best. Uh, we also have to make sure that the health and safety of, uh, of residents, uh, owners and tenants and uh, people who might be living in granny flats, for example, uh, as we try to uh, you know, make those units available, they need to get fire inspections, they need to get proper uh, exit uh, requirements. There, there's all kinds of things that are involved uh, and we wouldn't want to uh, we wouldn't want to rush things to the point where people aren't safe, uh, and we do want to make sure that people's voices, the people of Hamilton, uh, of our great city, are engaged in, uh, in the conversation. Keenan, back to you. We're not talking about rushing things. We're talking about making sure that the city is properly resourced so they can deal with these applications. As I go around the city, I hear from the, the person who is trying to build a back deck, and they are waiting months and months uh, to get the approval to do that. Where's the safety concern in building a back deck or in building a shed? Um, it is uh, really difficult for people to do anything uh, with the city because the city is not properly resourced um, and because it's, a, it's a, not a great place to work. And so we're losing a lot of people, um, whether it be in building approvals, uh, whether it be in permitting, uh, whether it be in economic development. We're losing the great talent in the city because the culture at City Hall is toxic. They're leaving to go into the private sector or to go elsewhere. And our plan is to invest in those city processes um, and those investments will yield and unlock uh, investments and in, in the, so they make uh, good economic sense. Thank you both for that. I'm being told we have time for another viewer question. And thank you very much to those who are tweeting to us at Cable 14 or who have emailed questions to us at uh, election at cable14.com. This person writes, in light of the latest delay announced in finishing the Eglinton LRT that started way back in 2011, do you have any confidence in Metrolink's involvement in Hamilton's LRT? And what will you do to ensure the least inconvenience to businesses and residents? I'm being told that this should be going to Andrea to start. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. I just want to say sheds and decks actually can be dangerous and do need to have regulations uh, and inspections. Having said that, though, uh, there's no doubt that the uh, Eglinton R LRT uh, is is just a nightmare in terms of how long it's taken, uh, in terms of the overruns of cost, in terms of the business disruption along the line in so many different business districts. Uh, there are examples uh, where things have gone pun, off the rails uh, when it comes to LRTs. But there are also great projects that have succeeded uh, and, and have done very wonderfully. Uh, I remember going to visit the uh, Kitchener uh, line when it was being built, talking to businesses along that route. Yes, there was disruption. Lots of good communication happened, though, uh, and the project was kept uh, on track. Uh, Ottawa, we saw some changes there that uh, uh, that happened during the process of build uh, that created problems afterwards. We can learn from the positive experiences and the ne negative experiences of other communities, and I'm looking forward to do exactly that. Thank you for that. Keenan. If I was living along Eglinton, I would not be happy uh, with the delays. That's for sure. Um, one of the aspects of that is that there, a, a big portion of that is a tunnel. Um, and so that is a big part of the delays. And there's no doubt that we and Metrolink should be learning uh, from the mistakes of the Eglinton LRT to make sure that we're not uh, uh, repeating those mistakes. So it's important to have somebody within the mayor's office who can call up the construction company every single morning and say, How, what's our progress today? What are we doing today? And then what are we doing for the businesses as well? As the head of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, I brought in uh, many experts to consult with the business community to help them understand what they will be facing uh, with construction and help them understand all of the methods that are being used in other communities that will help them get through that construction, whether it be creativity, whether it be communications, whether it be ha having uh, an enhanced digital presence online. There's ways that we can do it, 
Um, we just have to have uh, those level set expectations at the beginning. Candidate Loomis, thank you. Andrea, back to you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, that's something I've talked about a lot, actually, is the uh, communications piece. I think it's extremely important. I had the experience of a major uh, construction project on in a, in a fairly lengthy uh, business district, and that was when we narrowed King Street, put the bump outs, out, bump outs in, uh, expanded the sidewalks to make them more pedestrian friendly and make the businesses more uh, accessible uh, and to help calm the traffic a bit to uh, to boost our business district in the downtown. What happened there was the BIAs were very engaged. Uh, the BIAs became uh, almost um, the watchdog. Uh, every day the BIAs were in touch with the uh, project management team, uh, uh, in touch with me as the city councillor, we just we stayed on top of it, and that's what has to happen. Uh, you have to stay on top of these projects. You have to try to phase them in the way uh, that uh, is as least disruptive as possible, and you need to have strong communications. To both of our candidates, thank you very much for those responses. Uh, and again, thank you very much to uh, our media. That's all the time we have for our Q&A for our mayoral candidates. And uh, hey, to all of our media Thank you so much for participating over the last couple of weeks. Now, before we get to our open forum, we will give our candidates on stage a brief break as we hear from other candidates running for mayor. We heard earlier from Bob Bertina, Ejaz Butt, Paul Fromm, and Solomon EQ. Here now are Jimenez Ishoa and Michael Patterson. Hi. My name is Hermes Ishaya, youngest mayoral candidate in the city of Hamilton. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and moved to Canada as a young person. Being a young person in the city, I understand the struggles that many young people face. Throughout my time, I always wanted to make a change, and now I have finally gotten the opportunity to do so. I want to make the most out of it and help as many people as I can. I've always been a person that would not give up easy on an idea I believe in. I will fight for change until that change is done. I'm not somebody that will ignore problems. I will always tackle them head on and try to come up with a good solution as soon as I can. If elected mayor, my plans are to completely overhaul our housing market, improve our education system, and invest in family businesses. Housing has recently become a major topic for all of us. I plan to, on improving the housing market by building more houses, which in return will cause house prices to go down and also cause rent prices to go down. I'm also planning on eliminating high tax rates for first-time homeowners to create an equal playing field. Infrastructure is another topic I want to look into. We need to renovate our buildings and build new ones. We need to work on our construction and stabilize our roads that are breaking down our vehicles. In Hamilton, we have a lot of bright youth that are not given the chance to voice their opinions and share their ideas. I plan to give the youth a chance and create a platform for youth to get involved. I'll work with school boards to improve our schools and transform our education system. I plan to connect with people in the city by being simplistic and transparent. I am not an ordinary politician. A vote for me is a vote for everyone that is hardworking in the city. A vote for me is a vote for a brighter future. Thank you. Hello, I am Michael Patterson. This is my third campaign for the position of mayor. I'm an independent general laborer, and I'm here to work for you. My reason for forging this campaign is to speak truth to the constituents of Hamilton. COVID has and will be a very trying time for the Corporation of Hamilton. With the added pressure of $92.3 million, or 30% of COVID spending that is yet, not being addressed or finalized dollar for dollar from either level of government, and we are left advocating for relief. This election, Hamilton's pressing financial needs have to be addressed in real world time. The current 3.3 residential tax increase is just holding the wolves at bay. The current global financial predicaments, interest rates, inflation, supply chain issues, combined with homelessness, mental health and a rental crisis has eroded our city, like other municipalities across Canada. The time for action is now. The newly elected leaders of Hamilton must find cohesive and fiscally responsible solutions to the problems that Hamiltonians face. I give our previous administration a subtle pat on the back for holding our city to the 2017 resolution of the AA plus credit rating. Whether this was maintained through true fiscal management or leaving constituents behind is the question.
It has enabled our corporation to have beneficial lending terms, but that said, we are facing an uphill battle. There is no magical answer to fix these problems, but there is a word that can put us in the right direction, pride. Civically, communally, and individually, we can overcome these obstacles together. I believe that the next mayor of this city, following the status quo, will be despised, yet with some gumption, can become one of the most beloved mayors this city has ever seen. So remember, on October 24th, I like Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the mayoral candidates for their pre-recorded statements. Jim Davis is also running for mayor. However, he declined to participate in recording a statement for this program. We are now moving on to our open forum. Our candidates on stage here at the Westdale have a minute to direct a question to their counterpart. That candidate will have a chance then to respond and then we will open up the floor for any further discussion. I will let you know if our time requires us to move on. We drew numbers ahead of our broadcast to determine the order of the segment. Candidate Keena Loomis, you are up first with your question. Okay, thank you very much. Andrea, I am a constituent in Hamilton Center, and you led me and my neighbors to believe that you were committed to being our representative and being premier. I heard you address this in a recent interview, and you said that you haven't heard that people are, are as upset about this, and that seems surprising especially given that you so served three weeks and given that we're going to be spending a million dollars filling your vacated seat. My neighbors and folks I've talked to at the doors are all talking about this. It's a valid perspective shared in the community that you chose to represent. My question is, have you considered how this would cause people to lose trust with you? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, this kind of gotcha type of politics, uh, this U.S. style of, uh, of politics is really disappointing. Uh, everybody knows what happens in a parliamentary democracy like ours. There are so many examples uh, of people who, uh, who don't get elected premier, for example, or prime minister, uh, and, and seek to serve at another order of government. I know that I have a lot to offer the people of Hamilton. Uh, I know uh, that my experience will, uh, will prevail when it comes to tackling the challenges that we have. Uh, I just, I find it unfortunate uh, that, um, that this kind of uh, tenor uh, is, uh, is where my colleague here decided to go. Uh, when we talk about U.S. politics, maybe he can talk about whether or not he's going to maintain his U.S. citizenship and pay taxes as a U.S. citizen if he becomes the mayor. That's a question I think that he should be answering if he wants to go that in that direction. Open for discussion. Okay, you seem to be very adept at U.S. politics yourself. Um, so you haven't heard the concern at all from anybody? I have not. Oh, from, uh, from one person, a, a friend of yours, Laura uh, uh, Babcock. We talked about it on her show. Okay, well, it is a, it is a valid concern. I mean, the thing is that um, there was a lot of talk that you were running for mayor as you were running for premier. Um, and in fact, you approached a lot of people about running for mayor. That's completely untrue. And so, to <laughs> making stuff up. So, how could you be doing both? <laughs> well, you know what, Keenan, it's beneath you to make stuff up like that. That is absolutely not true, and and you should be ashamed of yourself. The fact of the matter is, I had made a, a, a commitment, and I fulfilled that commitment. And I'm proud of the work I did as the leader of the political party. I took that party from Nowheresville into the official opposition, not once, but twice. We elected 50% women three times, in fact, 60% women last time. But there comes a time when every leader knows uh, that they need to move over uh, and provide uh, opportunity for other leaders to take over. And so after I had had that thought process, not before, not with made up uh, accusations about meetings that never happened. I know what integrity is. I've served with integrity and I will always serve with integrity. Uh, but uh, these kinds of trumped up <laughs> accusations are just, they're mid beneath this conversation. It was the most open secret in all of Hamilton. <laughs> Maybe people were chin wagging about it. It certainly is uh, honorable. I'm honored actually to have people talking about that. They were talking about it for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but the fact of the matter is I take my responsibilities and my obligations uh, very, very seriously. I had 
uh, those obligations that I needed to fulfill. And of course, it's politics. People are always talking about what might happen, what may happen, who might be doing this, who might be doing that. But to be a good leader, you have to stay focused, you have to stay committed, and you have to stay on your game. And that's certainly what, what enabled me to make the kinds of gains that I was ma able to make. But I, I do want to say this, uh, that work uh, is work that I'm proud of and that I will always be proud of. I think some of it might actually go down in the history books, which is a wonderful thing. But before, now before my goal on, is Keenan, the city of Hamilton. Well, I just want to say, again, it's the most open secret in all of Hamilton <laughs> um, before the election. And so, um, as a matter of fact, you're being disingenuous to the people of Ontario when you said wow. you wanted to be their premier. Thank you for that response. Uh, Andrea, we can continue on now. Your question to candidate Loomis. Yeah, thanks very much. I actually have a question about his platform as opposed to um, anything else. And that is, uh, as was mentioned by the reporter a little bit earlier, uh, the talk of an immediate uh, zoning bylaw change. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Loomis, where does he come up with his 50,000 units in 10 years? How exactly is that going to happen, considering every single person that I talk to that's in building or construction or development has, has basically snickered at that possibility. Uh, it's, it's not fair to people uh, to put these, uh, these numbers out there. It's in fact, it's doing people a disservice. So unless he, uh, so maybe he can explain how exactly uh, he's going to achieve those 50,000 units because we know that housing is absolutely a priority uh, here in the city of Hamilton. Thank you for that. Keenan. So the fact of the matter in business, that which you cannot measure, you cannot achieve. 50,000 is not only doable, but it's absolutely necessary. It's what the province is requiring us to do uh, right now by forcing us to plan to be a city of 800,000 people by 2050. If you do the math, it means that over the next 10 years, we need to be building uh, 50,000 units in Hamilton, which is about double the pace that we're doing right now. And if we clear away the red tape and all of the bottlenecks at City Hall, we will be able to achieve that. If we it, work hard at bringing the investment into the city, we will be able to achieve that. Much of this is already service land. Again, we're not building this within uh, our uh, outside of the urban boundary. We're holding the urban boundaries. And so it's about uh, attracting investment. It's about facilitating these types of uh, uh, developments. And it's not just private sector. It's the not-for-profit sector as well. And our 50,000 number uh, was tested by Mike Moffat, who is one of the, the leading researchers in this field in the province of Ontario. And he determined that what Hamilton needs to build over the next 10 years is 52,000 uh, units. So there you go. I was off by 2,000. Open for discussion. <laughs> well, saying that we need 52,000 units is not the same as saying that we're going to be able to achieve 52,000 units. It, it's actually quite different. Uh, but but what I what I what I heard was really not very much of a plan. Um, I heard about uh, uh, more. Uh, assurances that it can happen, uh, but but we don't really have a plan from Mr. Loomis in regards to uh, how that uh, how that can actually take place. The, the bottom line is, uh, it, and fa in fact, the fact is that just today the CBC was talking about. Uh, the, the, the gridlock when it comes to development of housing all across the GTA. 22 months on average across the GTHA for development of housing. In, in Toronto, the fact is 31 months is how long it takes to develop housing. So there is a significant problem and there is a competition for staff uh, and some of our staff are, are leaving our city. Uh, we need a complete uh, look at a recruitment and retention strategy to get the people in place that we need and start to, to uh, undo the log jam when it comes to housing because it is an absolute priority. Keenan? This is old guard politics rearing its head again um, and saying that we can't achieve as a community. And I find that frustrating. And I find that that's exactly what it is that we need to clear away in this election. We need fresh transformational change at City Hall because we will be able to achieve uh, that and so many other things if we work together. Uh, and we certainly won't be able to, again, uh, with uh, old guard style politics. And it's, it's just unfortunate. But we used to be the ambitious city. Something happened. Um, 
and uh, it certainly over the last couple of decades uh, has been mired uh, in city hall bickering politics. I guess uh, my uh, competitor wants to continue that along, and we can't. We're hearing at the doors. People are fed up with this. People are fed up with hearing that we can't. We need to hear that we must and we should. Can I just say that um, what we don't need is people throwing numbers out that don't make any sense uh, and that are not credible. That's a disservice to the people of Hamilton. Yes, we need to work hard. Yes, we need to address the problems. But throwing out numbers just because you think it's something that's going to get people's attention, that's old style politics. That's promises that get made and never kept. I've seen a lot of it over the years as a leader of an opposition party. Uh, and maybe Mr. Loomis doesn't recognize it because he's so new to the to the world of politics but I can tell you for sure that when you make these kinds of promises that don't hold water that have no basis in reality uh, then you're doing a disservice to the people uh, what my plan does is it talks about specific ways that we can begin to to lighten up that logjam to get the staffing in place uh, to make sure that we're uh, digitizing some of the approvals process that we put together a portal uh, so that people can actually trace where their applications are are uh, in the pipeline uh, so that we have somebody that's a point person for all Peter of the applications that are coming forward. Thank Those are much. real solutions. We, we do have to continue to move on now. And I believe our next question is coming from, yes, coming from candidate Loomis. Your question, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just this morning, you said that Hamilton doesn't need a 311 system, which is a big part of our, um, our platform. For a city the size of Hamilton, it's absurd that we don't have it. We're the largest city in the entire country that does not have a 311 system. I've lived here, obviously, and can tell you that residents and neighbors are not satisfied with 546 City. Are you saying that you think the status quo for how the city communicates and makes themselves accessible to Hamiltonians is sufficient? Uh, what I'm saying is we have a system that's been in place for far, far before Mr. Keenan came to town, or Mr. Loomis came to town, rather, uh, and it's called 546 City. Uh, and it's unfortunate that he doesn't let his people know when he's talking to them on the doors that we do have something called 546 City. And what I also said, which he neglected to mention, uh, is that in fact, if we need to get uh, an overhaul where perhaps we're changing the number, making it more accessible, uh, you know, a good idea is a good idea, that's fine, but we don't need to, uh, to recreate the wheel uh, when it comes to 546 City. Maybe he's never used it. I certainly have. I know lots of people uh, that have. And in fact, it's a pretty good service, uh, again, we want to change the number, great, uh, but, uh, but let's not ignore uh, that in fact there's a service that's available to residents of Hamilton uh, that if you access it, uh, you do get your question responded to. Keenan? 546 City is completely insufficient and I'm getting that from the people who work it. Uh, it's not the same as 311. 311 would give you a ticket, uh, have an online reporting capability, so not just uh, being able to call by phone, but an app-based one as well, so you can take a picture of a, of a pothole that needs fixing, and you can map it uh, for the city, and you can allow uh, the, the program to uh, track the progress of the, that issue. So it's not the same at all. Um, 311 is uh, really old technology, uh, it's, uh, but uh, it's something that can be completely modernized. We gave up on it a long time ago because we just decided, again, that we just can't do it. Um, and this is why exactly we need uh, new and fresh and innovative leadership that can bring the city into the 21st century, finally. Um, and that is what I am offering. Um, given the amount of taxes that we pay, People expect greater customer service in the city than what is being provided right now. Andrea? Uh, I would just like to submit that uh, whether it's 311 or 546 City, we have a real problem with our capacity and our ability to actually fill the pothole. Uh, we look at what's happened on Barton Street. We look at the shape of some of our roads. They're in tremendously bad shape. Uh, and so it's naive to suggest that a number is going to actually deal with the staffing shortages that we have, the capacity issues that we have, uh, and some of the other process issues that we have. But I, but I did say uh, that uh, when there's an idea that's a good idea, happy to look at it. Uh, but, but we have to remember it's not just about a, a number. It's about some of the other serious challenges that our city's facing uh, in terms of capacity and ability to do the work that needs to be done. Keenan, if you wish. 
response. I, I think she just said it was a good idea. So let's go for it. <laughs> All righty, there we go. We will now move on to uh, Candidate Horvath. Your question to Candidate Loomis, please. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Um, and Mr. Loomis, the fact is that you've changed your position several times, uh, or, or at least on several key issues over the last little while. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, very troubling uh, to see that, um, uh, that you're, as a candidate, uh, flip-flopping on your positions. And, and whether that's uh, urban boundary expansion, which, which at first you thought was okay, now you think is not okay. Whether that's area rating, which at first you were going to do overnight, uh, and now I guess because you've learned what it means to people and their ability to, uh, uh, to deal with the uh, financial pressures that they have right now, area rating was, it was going to go overnight. Now, apparently not so much. So I, I guess my question would be, how do you put forward uh, a, a confidence uh, to people that you know how to be a true leader? Uh, leadership means knowing what you're talking about, presenting that, uh, uh, that uh, plan. Uh, how can anybody trust your, your leadership if already you're flip-flopping on all kinds of issues? And these are only the ones I know about at this moment. Leadership means listening and adjusting your positions when it's the right thing to do. When I uh, advocated for the expansion of the urban boundary, I was advocating on behalf of a constituency as the president and CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And over the course of uh, those, uh, that time uh, in Hamilton, I also came to understand that people uh, finally care about how we're growing as a city. And I think that's a great thing. And I think that farmland should be protected. When it comes to area rating, um, I don't think there's a flip-flop at all. I said that it should be eliminated. I am saying now that it should ultimately be eliminated. Uh, it needs to be phased out, though. And a lot of that is coming from uh, going to the doors in the affected areas and understanding from them that they don't want to be paying higher taxes for transit uh, if they don't know what that transit plan is. So uh, the areas of Winona and Binbrook and Waterdown, they have uh, bad transit. That's what I hear time and time again. People, uh, not just residents, but the businesses are clamoring for better transit. And that means that they need to be able to invest in it. But transit planning takes a long time. And so we need to build that plan and show people what it is that we're asking them to invest in. Response? Uh, well, thanks, Mike. You know, it, it, what it really shows is a complete lack of experience and understanding of how the city operates. Uh, what you need to do is, is sharpen your pencil and understand what it is uh, that uh, is happening to Hamilton. I get it uh, that as the Chamber of Commerce uh, CEO and President, uh, Mr. Loomis had one constituency, uh, but there are many, many constituencies uh, in Hamilton. There are many, uh, there are many communities, uh, there are many interests, there are many people who really want to make this a uh, city, a great place, uh, a place where you can thrive, a place where you can ra raise a family, uh, a place where you can succeed, uh, where you can prosper, where you can grow old in, in, uh, in health. Uh, these are, are th the complexities of a city that, uh, that Mr. Loomis uh, is really um, not that um, uh, expo well exposed to, I guess is the word to say, uh, over the last little while. But that's dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous to think that with no experience, uh, with, with very very little time in our city with a, really a one constituency history uh, that you can just walk into the mayor's chair uh, and fix everything. Uh, that's, that's not how it works. However, how it does work is knowing your city inside and out, knowing exactly how the processes work, how to speed them up, how to focus and prioritize, and how to connect uh, with the people of Hamilton. That's Can certainly what I offer. I'm the one that has been living in the city for the last 13 years. I've been completely enmeshed in this community and all of the issues and the challenges that we are dealing with. And I'm proud to be able to listen to the folks, expand uh, the, the stakeholder base that uh, I have been working for. I was the voice of business in Hamilton. Um, and now I'm running to be the voice of Hamilton. And as a result, I'm listening and evolving as a candidate. And I think that that is uh, exactly what the people of Hamilton want to see. I don't think that what we need is more partisan experience. That, that doesn't achieve anything. There's really actually nothing there behind that except uh, experience being a politician. And what we need is not more of that. We need real leaders. I've been providing leadership in this community for the last 10 years. I have 
I have actually created jobs in this community because of my leadership, because of the, the work that I have done with so many stakeholders around this community. The leaders in this community know me, um, and they know that I know the issues, and I am not a neophyte uh, in this community at all. Well, I just have to say, if I uh, every day listen to what a privileged male told me I can or can't do, what I am or am not qualified for, I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. Uh, that's just nonsense. And uh, and again, it, it shows Mr. Loomis's lack of respect, but also lack of understanding of the rules. Thank you both very much. Uh, I'm being told that we are going to be moving on to Another round of questions. Okay, just making sure I got that right. Uh, candidate Loomis, you are up. Your question, please. Okay. Um, as you have uh, said repeatedly, you are running on experience, uh, Andrea. And you've been in politics certainly for a long, long time representing and Hamilton. And I'm proud Center. of it. Um, as opposition leader, you've provided a lot of criticisms, but not a lot of solutions. And it seems the only thing that has been accomplished is to make an enemy out of the premier. So I'll give you an opportunity to set the record straight. Uh, name, please, five tangible things you've delivered for Hamilton in the last five years. Well, you know, I, th I think the premise of the question is just um, uneducated. Uh, the opposition not only opposes what the government does, but we provide all kinds of solutions. Uh, and he should know this because we worked with the Chamber of Commerce of Ontario and, and small businesses and mom and pops around the province uh, to try to get them some support uh, from uh, the provincial government during this very last, uh, very difficult last couple of years. Uh, we've done all kinds of work and I have personally on all kinds of issues uh, that uh, affect the people of Hamilton. I, I'm not going to go through a list. You can do your homework and look it up for yourself but the people of Hamilton know uh, how hard I've worked for them and it has been my pride, my joy, and my honor uh, because I know, I know how to get things done, I know where to get things done, uh, and I know what the most important thing is, uh, is to listen to people uh, and to pay attention to what their needs are uh, and to pay attention uh, to the solutions that they, uh, that they bring forward. Uh, you know, I, I will uh, provide you an entire uh, index if you like. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of from Hamilton was working with our firefighters to bring presumptive legislation to Hamilton and to the rest of the province, which now all first responders have, uh, and it's an extremely important policy piece. And it came out of the Plastomet fire, something Mr. Loomis wasn't around for. Response? Okay, so one thing. That's fine. Thank you. Question time to you, oh, Andrea. Sure, sure. I, I guess um, Mr. Loomis keeps saying that, um, that uh, I somehow don't have uh, the experience needed to be the mayor or that my experience doesn't count, uh, which I think is, you know, highly disrespectful. But nonetheless, uh, I guess my, my question would be, what gives this person, uh, as opposed to somebody who has been ingrained in Hamilton for her entire life and working for Hamiltonians on so many fronts uh, for my entire career, uh, what gives him, someone who's been here for a couple of years, who's managed a, a small organization with a handful of staff and a small budget, uh, the capacity, the knowledge, the understanding uh, to, to be the mayor of the city of Hamilton, to just like walk in uh, and be the mayor of the city of Hamilton. I, I, uh, I really don't understand uh, where that um, chutzpah comes from. Uh, so maybe Mr. Loomis can uh, explain to us uh, how he has the qualifications necessary uh, to step into this very important role at a very important time in our city's uh, history. I think that's disrespectful to all of the people who live here in Hamilton who weren't born and raised. I married into Hamilton. I'm lucky enough that I was in a position to be able to move here with my family in 2009. And Hamilton is a city that I quickly fell in love with. And I saw it as being a city that could be so much more because it had been so much more as well. And so I immediately stepped in and began contributing uh, to this community. And I started at McMaster Innovation Park, helping build tech uh, businesses, working with uh, McMaster and all the other great talent that's in this community. And then I got the job as the president and CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, representing 1,000 businesses that uh, employ 75,000 people in this community. I know the issues in Hamilton inside and out because I have been representing the business community 
at several tables uh, within City Hall over the last decade. I have been on 25 different committees uh, dealing with 25 different issues uh, in this community. And one of the things that I have, uh, again, come to the realization of, and this is the whole purpose for me stepping down from the chamber, is that we need great leadership in this community to be able to live up to the potential that we have here. We have so many challenges, uh, for sure, and we need great leadership to deal with those, but we have so many opportunities, more opportunities than we have had in decades, and we need great leadership, uh, somebody with a business mind and a fresh vision for this community who can see beyond the next election cycle and focus on the city that this uh, Hamilton needs to be in 2050 when our kids are in their 20s and their 30s uh, and they're interacting Lewis, with their city. Thank you for that response. I agree, and I agree that we need great leadership, and I, I would like to um, uh, remind Mr. Loomis that uh, leadership is not just a label that you stick on your own chest. It's not something that you can claim. Um, Mr. LRT, he calls himself, and yet hundreds and hundreds of people for many, many years have worked on the LRT, you don't just get to the front of the parade and start cheering that you're Mr. LRT when everybody has been doing so much work for so many years. That's not what a leader does. A leader acknowledges the work of other people. A leader encourages the work of other people. Uh, but most importantly, a leader is someone who doesn't just talk about change as if it's something that's automatic. A leader has to have the skill skills, the experience, uh, the ability to make that change happen. And I have shown many times uh, that that's exactly the kind of leader that I am uh, and that I've been able to achieve many, many things, not for myself, uh, but for the people of Hamilton, the people of Ontario, uh, for my own political party, which once again uh, is important to acknowledge that that was uh, an important role for me. Uh, but I will be the mayor for all of Hamilton, for all of the people of this province, or rather of this city, regardless of what part of the province they might have come from, what country they might have come from, when they made Hamilton their home, uh, what uh, their circumstances are, what their income levels are, whether they're business people, uh, whether they're uh, working in not-for-profits, whether they're steel workers, Canada auto Horvath, workers. Thank you very That's much. That's the bottom line. We have a few seconds left. Candidate Loomis, if you like, final word goes to you. I have demonstrated time and time again as the voice of business, leadership in this community that brings tangible results. And I have worked with so many people in this community. I can't do it alone. I've, I understand that, I acknowledge that. I've surrounded myself with good people. I have created great relationships with the leaders in this community. And I will continue doing that going forward as the mayor of this great city. Unfortunately, our time with our mayoral candidates has run out. Once again, Bob Bertina had planned to be with us here at the Westdale, but has COVID. So on stage, we've had Andrea Horvath and Keenan Loomis. We also heard statements from Ejaz Butt, Paul Fromm, Solomon Ikuiu, Hermes Ishaya, and Michael Pattison. Candidate Jim Davis declined to participate in recording a statement. To our candidates here on stage, thank you both so much for your time this evening. We know how busy the campaign trail has been. And Hamilton, this concludes our mayoral debates and our entire debate series for this election. Before we close off, though, a special thank you and congratulations to each of the candidates who have stepped up to share their views over the past few weeks. As well, thank you to our colleagues in the Hamilton media for their participation and collaboration and to our friends here at the Westdale for hosting us. It's a beautiful facility. Finally, thank you to our amazing production crew who have worked tirelessly over the past few weeks to deliver all of these debates to you, our viewers. If you missed any of the debates, you can find all of them through the on-demand link at cable14.com elections, and you can find everything else you need to know, including a list of all the candidates running for city council, as well as the public and Catholic school boards on the City of Hamilton website at hamilton.ca slash elections. Now, you've heard from the candidates. Please make sure you get out and vote October 24th. For the final time this debate series, I'm Mike Fortune. We'll see you on October 24th, election night, with all the local results, because it's our Hamilton, our vote. <laughs>